Hey, this is Brad Caleb, PhD, and my PhD stands for Post Hole Digger. That means that I continue to work on the proper foundation for the prodigal son and daughter. Did Trump push the body of Christ to the brink? That was a question I asked the last time. And I realized that there is a whole lot more to share because the majority of people and that I deal with is actually more the body of Christ. People that are believers, people that believe and create a lifestyle based on the Bible or directions that they're getting in a church. And based on that, I have always been intrigued why the Americans were, and in particular the body of Christ, were so specific in dealing with Mr. Trump. Now, Mr. Trump is a salesman. He might be a good salesman for some people. Some other people say he is a criminal and some other people say he lies and he is a crook. But what is it really that deals with the body of Christ? Are they under attack? And in reality, I believe that the church, the body of Christ is mortally wounded. The body of Christ is under such an assault and mortally damaged. Yes, everyone's story has to be told. So I do believe that this is a very important story. It tells us about the savage, a renowned spirit, the fallen angel, Beelzebub, also an angel of light. He was a traitor towards God and many of the angels. And with the prompt arrival of a friend, familiar friend, somebody by the name of Jesuma, Jesua Hamashiach. Some of them might know him as Jesus because Jesua Hamashiach is the one that conquered. And there is a statement I picked up from Rosa Park. She says, I've learned over the years that when one's mind is made up, this diminishes fear. Knowing what must be done does away with fear. And I hope to inspire, not to criticize people, but by being critical, I like to inspire those that are in the body of Christ. Because folks, making a mistake, there is nothing wrong with. I've made many of them. And granted, I've had a chance to practice a bit. I was born in 1950, so that makes me this year come in June 71. But I believe that we are all facing an option. And the option is we either can choose life or we can choose death. And why am I talking about my PhD as a post hole digger? I came to the understanding after all the studies and after all the material that the easiest and best way is to stay simple. I used to have so many suits, three piece suits, a special tie for every meeting. And now I've come to the point that it is immaterial. Because if I am not on the right road, the road that God set out to be, and why God? Because I want to be in the presence of God. And I had a very complicated route to go as I started to understand the presence of God. It also meant I had to learn to throw away everything that I put value in. And some of you guys, folks, <laughs> It's going to be, I feel sorry for you because it took me years. It took me decades, actually six decades, 60 years before I wanted to accept it. But the reality is once your eyes are open, I wrote a book and it's called Deception Protocol for the Prodigal Son Blueprint. And then I started to break it down. I published the book in 2019. And the question that I had was, or somebody asked me, in order to promote my book, they wanted a video. And so I started to understand that being in court for 20 years, you start talking like a lawyer, complicated, covering your butt and everything. But I got to be simplistic. And so I started to break down the book that I had written and restorative justice series came out of it. Deception Protocol Simplified by Br'er Caleb. Now, Br'er Caleb is my... Avatar is the name that I use, but Brad Caleb was also one of the two people that were adults 
that went with Moses through the desert for 40 years, and he was 85 years of age when he arrived in the promised land. And remember, Moses had made a mistake. And when God said, you will see it, but you will not enter into the promised land, Caleb and Joshua, they entered the kingdom of uh, the promised land as adults. And the rest were all kids that had grown into adulthood. And it is so important to always go back to the basics. Whether you're in sports, it doesn't matter how good you are. But if you understand the importance of being indeed set free, being in the presence of God, that is what it's all about, folks. Not how good you are, not how rich you are, not how many billions you have stashed away for a rainy day, but are you a man or a woman that loves the Lord with all their heart and do seek His presence? This is something I wanted to share with you just for a moment. When I wrote my first book, it was actually something that uh, came forth out of the defense. We were in court for 20, almost 20 years. The first six years I had lawyers dealing with everything and it cost me millions of dollars. And then when I ran out of uh, working capital, $10 million, I was no longer allowed to have a lawyer representing us. So I had to represent ourselves. And that is what we did. My wife and I both, we took the books, took to the books, we grabbed a couple of law books and learned in a hurry. And the first case we won. And the Attorney General was so ticked off, he went to appeal and I had never been in appeal, so we lost the appeal. And then the case went on and on and on for 12 years. Now legally what they did was illegal. However, I'm not going to complain or dissect the case, but what I learned, I learned to understand something. That was the law. And I can now understand why our friend Paul was so infuriated with certain things and other issues he wanted us to understand, but he could not feed us. Why? Because our minds have been brainwashed. We have been brainwashed, folks, since 325 AD. We are Christians. We call ourselves Christians. But do you know that a Christian was a worshipper of a pagan god, Serapis, in 325 BC, before Christ, before Jesua was even born? Did you know that? See, I was forced by the judges, and we have seen a whole bunch of judges spend over four or five hundred hours in front of the judges. So I do know what I'm talking about, although I am not a lawyer. But I do know that when we lost the case, we went in appeal and we won on appeal. So there are different things that you need to learn. Now, this was criminal court. I was familiar with insurance law because that's what I studied in Europe. And then I was also very familiar with international law. But when you stand before a judge for criminal law where he can put you away for, for life if he wants to, then it becomes a different story. And this is what we all are going to face. One day, one moment, we will be standing before God Almighty. And we have to give account why we choose life or why we choose death. And folks, this is not fun. When you fool around like so many people with the pandemic, oh, I'm so tired, I don't want to wear a little napkin, I don't want to do this, I don't want to... And then they fall sick and then they get sick and then they die. Why can we not exercise patience, folks? Because we are so impatient. Everything has to be done instantaneously. If I'm waiting on my computer for two seconds, why is it so slow? We have been burdened with a special pro problem as a society. 
we want everything immediate, right now. And where's the patience? Where is the time that we can take where we slow down? Where can we sit down and be in the presence of someone and just enjoy it? Enjoy a good book, reading something. Now we had, in the old days, we had prophets. They were like a mirror. They were actually the people that shared what it was going to be, what the future could hold, but also what had happened in the past. And so for us, for people, the body of Christ living in the mainstream, we are so powerful. We have money. We think that we have it. And then we come out to an understanding that we have been hoodwinked. Yes, folks, hoodwinked. And that is not fun. Now, where are we going with this? When I came back to Europe, I didn't recognize it. I'd been away for about 35, 40 years, traveling around the world first. Then my wife and I settled in Canada and we lived there for 35 years till I had the big run in with the government because that was what it was. I had a gentleman that wanted to have half of my business. He happened to be a Freemason. On top of that, he was my friend and he was the head of the Freemasons. Now, we never really discussed it, but he showed me one thing. He said, Bob, if you do not do what I want you to do, you're going to regret it. You have no idea how much power I have. And when someone is prepared to destroy a friend just because he, as a multi multimillionaire, doesn't get a few more millions, you are dealing with some very evil stuff. And if the churches are run by Freemasons or P1s or P2s or P3 or Black Popes, folks, you got a major problem. And that is what we're dealing with today. We have the Freemasons dealing in politics, dealing in the banks. We have them dealing in the churches. And then you wonder why we have a problem. So I am not going to debate Mr. Trump. He is just an example. Mr. Trump has been groomed since 1991. Since 2001, the GOP in the United States has been bought out bit by bit by bit. Because why are you afraid? Because you're losing your name? No, you're losing your money. All your money. And if you understand that you as a Christian are looking just for your money, then you are mistaken. See, there is the body of Christ that was a group of believers that believed in unquestionable truth. They built Christian communities. They taught people incredible discoveries to society. They raised society. And what do we have to show for today? The third temple restoration in Jerusalem for dummies. Because that is the book that I started to write or actually wrote. I've not published it because I focus more on the short videos. But as I came across it, I realized that I should be dealing with this. Why are the Christians in the United States so enamored with Mr. Trump? Mr. Trump was just selling them something. You want peace in Jerusalem? No problem. I'll give it to you. He couldn't care less. He doesn't believe. All he believes in is himself and himself. Oh, and did I mention myself? That is all he believes in. But that's his problem. And he has to deal with that. But why are Christians buying his garbage? He says he is a Christian. And he doesn't even know what a Christian is. Do you know what a Christian is? Are you aware that Jesus was not a Christian? Jesus was the one that opened the way, the truth, and the light. And why was that so important? He gave two options. He said, there is a small path and there is a broad way. Now, guess what the broad way is, folks? The broad way has become Christianity. If you are Christian today and you think you're doing an awesome job, I would urge you to pay attention because you are on the wrong way. Yes, folks, you are on the wrong way. See, there are a parable of the ten virgins. Now, I heard that when I was six years old, seven years old, 
eight years old, I've heard it my whole life. And if every time I asked, who are the five wise virgins? I was told, oh, those are the ones that dress nice. They dress appropriate. They don't use mascara. They don't use this. They are this and this and this. When I started preaching myself for many years, I wasn't sure because it says so many things, but it wasn't right. In my spirit, I felt there is something wrong. And later on, when I ended myself in a very precarious scenario where I got sentenced for six years to jail, maximum security, I tell you folks, it wasn't fun. But my eyes opened because the whole process was controlled by my Freemason friend and his buddies. Of course, after 12 years, they will get you somewhere, somehow. And the beauty was, I lost everything. Millions of dollars, properties. We had acres and acres of property with trees and everything. I lost it all. And on top of it, billions of dollars of collateral. But you know what is more important? What I also lost was the misconception. I finally saw for the first time, who am I? I am a prodigal son or a daughter, for that matter. What it is, is that we are not just people that believe because Satan tells us what to believe. See, when I started this series, Restorative Justice, I learned this in jail. We were talking with the Inuits. We were talking with the people that were born in the United States or in Canada, people that were the true original people, the inhabitants of the United States. Not the import Americans with the big mouth like Trump. He's not an American. He's an, I hate to say it folks, he's just like you and me. But he has a bigger mouth and he thinks that he's King Kong. But the reality is, if you are an immigrant and you get immigrated to another government or another country, you have to respect the laws of the land. And those were the people, the natives. Those were the Indians. And when I sat there and I wanted to go with them and understand what they were talking about, they were talking about restorative justice. If somebody has done something that benefited yourself and disadvantaged somebody else, somebody else is hurting or somebody else had been killed, then you have to restore the balance. And it is a very tough subject. And as I started to understand the concept of restorative justice, I started to recognize what God was doing. God had set the same restorative justice between mankind and himself. See, Satan knew that God was the law. God was an awesome God, but within his presence, everything can happen because God speaks on a different level. He speaks on a 12-dimensional level. And we human beings, we are so limited. If I speak English, French, German, and, and Dutch, I'm an awesome dude in the eyes of many people. But we don't even speak the language of creation. Why? Because we have let ourselves go down. And so going back to the parable of the 10 virgins, who are those five virgins that are wise? And who are the five foolish ones? Folks, that doesn't mean that if you have 10 people, five are going to heaven and five are not. And we'll state very simple that we each individually have a choice. We can either allow and make the choice to follow God or follow death, life or death. And you will say, ah, that is so heavy. Everyone has been talking about it. But God says, with the parable of the 10 virgins, we have to make a decision. Now, what does the oil mean? Well, that is my good deeds. That's my this. That's how I talk. No way. God is a God of principles and is a God of laws. And if God says there is life when we choose him, then what is the life? And then we have to go back to the basics again. Remember, I'd been in court so long that I finally got to understand what evidence was. We have to go to the evidence. 
What was the evidence that God could say, choose life or choose death? When Adam and Eve were kicked out of the paradise, that was to save them, not to, to punish them. It was to save them because if they would be living forever in a state of <coughs> incompetence, they were not complete. They would be punished for life, for life forever. And so therefore, God immediately stopped that because God created men. He created them as the soil and the natives call them Mother Earth. And I come to respect that. It's Mother Earth. And from this soil, Adam was made because God and his holy breath gave life. And as a human being created like a fetus, but now as a full grown man, he had to learn how to be a God because God had created mankind to live forever. So if you are a biohacker and you pop pills and you do this and you do that because you want to be healthy, then I share something with you because by being a biohacker, that means that you take control over your health. But how can you have a healthy body and an unhealthy mind? You have to have a balance. You have to have health, physical, mental, and spiritual. And the spiritual aspect, that is the aspect that we're dealing with. Going back to the 10 virgins. So five of those virgins had the understanding that God's wisdom was because God is a law. And if we do what God says, that means we have a covenant. Now, what is the difference between a covenant and a commandment? A covenant is between two parties that are friends that say, listen, if you do this, I will help you. And I will make sure that I cover you, I protect you, I make sure that nothing will happen to you. And what is that? That is a covenant for the children of light. And when Moses finally came with the covenant down to share with the people, they were dancing and acting like morons. And he got so mad, he threw those 10 commandments down and they broke and pulverized. But God says, I will give the children of the darkness I will give him the Ten Commandments. Now, what are those Ten Commandments? We, as a sophisticated nation, United States, Europe, England, and whatever nation based it on, we all use the Ten Commandments as our foundation for our laws, our moral interaction as human beings. But what God meant it to be, was that we learn to understand what the foundation was going to be in the kingdom of God. See, in God's kingdom, you have one God. There are no people that fool around. They don't steal. They don't lie. And we can't do that here. We lie. We steal. That's why the courts are filled. So if we cannot maintain the proper foundation, that is the Ten Commandments for the people that chose death and then the people that chose life, it was a covenant. A covenant is each what I hold that's dearly. It's like my wife and I get married and I have a ring and I commit myself to her and I say, honey, I'm going to be with you forever. And then two days later, I see their woman, woo, you know, and my eyes start wondering. That is not a covenant. That's a fool acting that way. But if I have a covenant, I have a commitment. I made that commitment to my wife and my children. I am the provider. I am the one that will help them. I will be there for them forever. And that is what God did with us. He made a covenant for the children of light. Are you a child of the light? And when I say the light, that means that you are not coming down and say, oh yes, I prayed a sinner's prayer. That's wonderful, friend. But that means nothing. Because Jesua Hamashiach, known to you folks most likely as Jesus, he came as the way, the truth, and the light. 
And why was that so important? Because God said, that is a small way. That is where I will be. His presence is only on that small path, not on the broad way, where two and a half billion people are Christians and wonderful, we screw around, we just cheat, steal, lie, do whatever. We follow Trump like a moron, insurrection, whatever, because he will let us to the final, the end time. Folks, you got to think and hear yourself think. Why is the parable of the ten virgins so important? Because you still have a choice. You can make that decision. And I know a lot of people will say, oh yeah, you need to talk in love. I am talking in love. Because right now, if the light of God shines through you, that means that we are doing what God asked us to do. That means I change. I repent. I say, Father, forgive me. And I don't do it anymore. I am a prodigal son. I am recognized now that I was wrong and that I don't have to eat with the pigs. I don't have to smell like a pig. I am a person that is seeking the presence of God. And that is the light that shines through us. And that is the light that God will recognize. Not because you gave so much, you did this, you did that. That has to do with outside manners. But inside, do you do because you love God? Does that mean you don't make mistakes? No. But like every good father, parent, you love your children. And if you don't know what it means to love, God will be there. His presence. And folks, you don't need Mr. Trump to rally all up and, hey, let's do this and let's do that. And then the moment he doesn't need you, he throws you under the bus like he's done with most of his people. Folks, when we seek the presence of the Lord, God is an awesome God. He loves you, he cares for you, and he personally will teach you. That's just what I want to share for today. And we will break it down. Is there a third temple? There is, but we don't have to fool around and negotiate politically to make sure that we get to that part, because that is not what we are looking for, folks. We need to learn and understand that God is an awesome God. He is a spiritual God, and we need to learn to understand what God means, not what our Joe Blow pastor, whoopie do whatever, is saying. God's Spirit will lead you. And he is going to be your teacher. Are you open for that? And if you're not, tough times never last. But tough people, they do. I wish you all the best. Have a great day. Bye for now.
Let's go. 